Hello, hello. Hello, Jenna. Hello, Amber. Hello. Oh, hello, Justin. I'm sorry. Hello, Justin. Yes. Hello, Kimberly. Hello. I said Jenna. Hello, uh, Sheeran. Hello, Erica. Hello, Ad good afternoon. And by the way, again, this is the opportunity for us to straighten out how I'm badly pronouncing your names. So it's awkward for everybody, but please correct me with your voice if you can, or you can even spell phonetically if I'm doing it wrong. So yes, hello, Armand. And I'm still never even clear if I'm saying Armin or, I mean, I know it's been two semesters now, but if you wanted to, is it Ar, do I just say Armin or Armand? I'll leave that. And same thing, with, I think I hope I'm saying Alinelli right. Good morning, Alanelli. Please, Kurt and Rachel. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon. Sorry. And uh, the second. Oh, now I forgot. Oh, the second one. Okay. So, like, Armand. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Oh, and yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is helpful. This is so. We'll remember this forever as that little star. Okay. Um. Oh, and more people coming. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Great. Um, hello, guys. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Yes. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Rachel. Good afternoon, Abby, if I didn't say yes. Good. Uh, okay. No, I did say that. Sorry. Okay. And who else do we have? Oh, Alyssa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Aaron. Good afternoon. More. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sarah. Sorry. Did, oh, I did say that. No, I didn't. Yes. Good afternoon, Sarah. Uh, and good afternoon, Alyssa. Cool. Okay. Isn't this so weird? I mean, we could write like a Jane Austen novel about the you know, that's the other thing no one talks about. Actually, probably everybody talks about it, and I probably don't watch enough news. Probably Don Lemon talks about this. But, you know, like after, God willing, after COVID and all that, when we all return to something, there's going to be a whole new reevaluation of etiquette. Like all the things that we've always taken for granted, just like, hello, goodbye, what's up, what's up, take your hand, how, are, like things that just are normal to do, like, like shaking hands, right? I think it's, we're done with shaking hands, I think, like forever. Like, and we always think of shaking hands as something that's been with us forever, but no. And a side note on that, or wait, uh, another example of that, like, um, you know, it's really crazy to me if you ever, you know where shaking hands I think comes from, by the way, I'm kind of making this up, but I'm 99% sure this is right because it makes so much sense. I don't know if anybody, well, this is a digression, but where I think shaking hands comes from originally is it's a ritual designed to show that you don't have a gun. If you know what I mean, like it's a like exchange, it's like a it's it comes from rituals where people would meet each other and hand over their guns as a like like when one official is meeting another official and they like literally and that that ritual was such an important ritual among statesmen and stuff. And it, oh wait, oh yeah, oh or in swords, even swords, right? Even better, swords, of course, right? Oh, and I'm right. Okay, great, right? So oh, and remove your hat. Yeah, that's cool, right? So all those things, very cool. I love how you guys actually pay attention to this stuff, right? So like. You know, and now we have things like now our new versions of guns and swords, right, are masks. I mean, in the reverse, in a way, like masks are like shields, I guess. But like, there's a whole thing surrounding masks, and blah, blah, blah. You all get it. But I mean, um, but what? But, you know, on that note, and here's a real physics. OK, granted, digression, just warm up thing. But as all part of our hello. Oh, and hello, Marissa. I, hello. OK. Um, you know where God bless you comes from in terms of sneezing? Does that, have we mentioned this before? Like you ever notice if you sneeze, people tend to say something like bless you, but not if you cough, right? Only if you sneeze, which sometimes is awkward. Does any of you know where that comes from? I mean, I do, I think. I mean, it's a quick, you, what? Oh, I actually, oh, cool. I actually thought it was the plague, but similar, maybe it was. I might, even, it definitely is a thing like that. Yeah, I, I thought it was the medieval plague, but the black plague, but yeah, maybe it is the Spanish influence, but it definitely it's the idea, right? When you, I never knew this growing up, but when someone sneezes and someone else says, God bless you, what they're kind of originally saying, they're not only saying, I hope you don't die because that's what originally sneezing would have meant during the Spanish influence or a plague. Not only when you say, God bless you, like, I hope you don't die now, but you're also kind of saying, God bless you. And by the way, God bless you. Like God be with you. Like could get the hell away from me, please. Cause like you've got, something it's a way of saying like ah god bless you but i'm not gonna bless, like let god take care of you and maybe far away because you've got covid i mean or well the play right and so it's a very strange expression in that way and i'm sure we're developing things like that in all this culture anyway uh 
Well, you do stop. That is interesting. Yeah, right. Aaron, very good. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, of course, none of these things, like nothing I'm saying is exactly true and everything has more of a complicated story. There's definitely something scary and weird about breathing where you, I mean, about sneezing, where you stop breathing for a second. Um, but I, but yeah, I, I get, but I do think the origins of the expression have to do with like serious, serious, uh, um, uh, like epidemics or pandemics or whatever, where sneezing really took on a scary, but you're right, sneezing is already kind of a scary, weird thing and watching a small child sneeze, they, they always look totally shocked when the sneeze is over, like, where did that come from? Um, but, but anyway, yes, so all this is fascinating. Why am I even talking about it? I don't know, um, but okay, oh, oh, okay, well, there you, okay. It always comes down to some, po yeah, okay, cool. I'm willing to, um, that's interesting. No, that is cool. Um, and we we could get, you know, the relationship of physics and popes, like that's a whole class in itself. And um, some of the best- Wait, studies. Professor Yaverbaum, yeah. did you know if you held your eyes open and sneeze, your eyes would pop out of your head? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm glad you raised that. I, I personally have never done that experiment, but I do, but I- Yeah, no, I haven't <laughs> either. I've just heard it from people, you know? Yes. No, I've definitely <laughs> heard that. Yeah, that is a good, I mean, I, yeah, that's an urban legend that I'm willing to believe. Absolutely. Like, I don't even, yes. It seems yeah, I don't even want it tested. Right, I don't, right, right, right. I'll believe you. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I, I mark my word, if Aishan ever does try that out in front of the class, whatever, I, I mean, I hope he does, but whatever might happen to him in the process, I just want everybody to know that he has my blessing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, man. But okay. Oh my God. This is oh so God. This okay. Oh, wait, chat. That's it's not. Oh, okay. All right. There's some evidence that just came in that says it's not true. Um, I and I'm willing to believe that I'm definitely not going to do the experiment either way. I definitely know it's very hard uh to to hold your eyes closed while you okay, but any well, I've heard other weird things about sneezes too that some of you might have heard in relations between things that happen in your brain when you sneeze versus when you orgasm. It's, I don't, but all that is beyond me. I'm a physicist, not a biologist. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I don't know nothing about none of that stuff. Um, uh, but I do know sneezing is weird. Um, okay. Um, and and I'm totally taking seriously. The fact, if, yeah, that could be a, wow. Um, oh, well, okay. Last thing, as long as we're doing this, and this is funny too, because we are going to have a funny class today, but Physics of sneezing would be a great project if anybody ever wanted to do it. But for that matter, I'll tell you what, what I'm really tempted during this whole, I haven't done it yet, but during, if, if COVID lasts enough, if we have to do this yet again in the fall, I'll tell you what, someone needs to do a prism project on the physics of smell, because that is a fascinating and untapped thing. And in my, in my secret weird thoughts, I think that's one of the things, no matter how good a Zoom class could maybe ever be, and it can't, but like, one thing that no matter what we do in Zoom and YouTube and all that, like one thing that we are not exchanging, not to be weird, but the one thing that you guys are, at least in the current state of the internet, we are not exchanging smells in any way in this class. And like, okay, maybe thank God, because maybe we don't have to shower before Zoom classes. And maybe that's a blessing, like a saving grace for all of us. But if you think about it, smell is like the one thing that is like a hugely part of life all the time and hugely part of emotions and associations and thoughts, but it's totally absent from electronic communication. And it's the really the one thing that's completely absent from electronic communication is smells. And smells, you all know this, like they seep into your unconscious and make impressions, like they affect your taste more than you ever recognize. They affect your memories of childhood. And like you can remember smells from your childhood more vividly than you can remember colors right, and stuff like that. And it's weird that like that's the whole sense that really has been removed from us in the new remote environment. Um, and maybe someday, I mean, maybe it won't be, but like, I, I don't know, that's an untapped something, something, I think. But anyway, I'm totally babbling with chat. I have a story for that. Uh, it might be a little bit uh, TMI, but it's nothing crazy. Okay. Um, I've had my best friend, me and my best friend have been friends for like six years now. And she always, she wears this one um, perfume from Victoria's Secret. And one year she gifted it to me and it's become one of my comfort smells. So like I, I spray it when like I miss her or like I'm sad and it makes me feel better. See, that's so, I, I love this a lot. I, first of all, that's class with this patient right there. You know, the guy opens up his heart. If you don't think you get <laughs> points for that, then your heart is closed. That's number one. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's right. A comfort smile. I like that. Right. And like, you, I mean, you all say, okay, I'm just going to return the courage of that, or that share, so to speak. The thing that Aishan just said, 
I'll just go a step further and, and, and you know, risk myself here. One thing that I started doing when I was really hating these Zoom classes, and I don't, and I don't mean you guys, but when this whole process was really getting me down and I could barely get myself to do it, I will say I did start, and, and then there was one day when Justin and others were giving advice in the class of like things to do. And you know, I was pretending all that advice was for students, but it was like, you really, I was definitely taking it in. And one thing I started doing after I recreated my work environment to make it better for Zoom class levels, and I can't believe I'm about to say this because this is completely, this is just personal, but just to, you know, to return kind with kind. Like I now light a candle before I start teaching, which freaks my son out. But, and for no reason other than to, between the smoke and the flame, whatever, it just makes the whole thing seem a little bit more organic and a little bit more alive somehow. It would be like having a plant on my desk, except that I know I would kill that, whereas somehow I don't kill candles. Um, and yeah, and and okay, and last thing, like Owen Yabo said, um, I do agree, smell is like a neuroscience and evolution thing. I'm not saying it's not, but you know, what I do take pride in the fact that physics is at the root of neuroscience and bio, like if something is related to any science, then there is a physics connection to it. But sure, the special, like if you're really, really looking at smell, you have to go neuroscience. I totally agree with that. Um, but now physics, ha, 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 sorry. Okay, right. That is what I, I mean that physics does not smell like cheese. -it. Yeah, right. Um, I, that is, I'm so glad cheese it's still exists. You know, I actually love Cheez Its, and that is shocking that anybody should like a food whose name includes like a synonym for pimples. Like, why do I want to eat anything named after my. Oh, Professor, you didn't need to do that. You didn't need to do that. I love oh, okay. it. Okay, I don't have to do all of that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, let's do physics. I'm sorry. You're totally right. Okay, okay. This is my, my, okay. I love this class. Did I mention? And even <laughs> as I, I'm looking at it, there's so many colors in this zoo. Like, I love that you all have these images. Okay. So it's time to do class. <laughs> um, we, um, Professor, we, you may have ruined cheese. It's forever for me. <laughs> no, the guy that named them that, that, that was uh, he ru all right, I'm sorry. I never thought about that. I did not think of that. How do you look? You want to I'm really gonna ruin that. I'm very sorry to everybody who's not a Sean here. Actually, I'm even most sorry to Ashawn, but can oh I say, God. can I say, all right, if we're if, if, if I've already ruined it, I can't do any worse. Can I say okay. by the time I get to zits? I've already, my mind has already leaped over the temptation to think toe cheese when I hear cheese. Ew. Sorry, well, that's what it made. I mean, it's a horrible name. It's not, oh God, I'm sorry. All right, I just, <laughs> people, I'm, oh God. Oh, I'm so, all right, I'm really, really sorry. I'm really, okay, I, yes. Yeah, I, I feel like we all deserve a little bit of compensation for that one. <laughs> You okay? Yeah, it's funny you say that. Um, you will be compensation today, actually, uh, because I'm going to talk less than usual. Now I always say that. Well, maybe I could do better. Comp all right, I'm going to think about the compensation, but I'm going to say to everybody, I actually, with all of this uh, stuff, we're actually going to do more. We're going to. There's going to be more period of today of you guys actually working and us all catching ourselves up with whatever homework we're on. I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning, but then I am going to turn it more to you guys. I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, I don't really think that's what Ashan's talking about, but that is what's going to happen. Uh, hold on, sorry. Um, uh, so that said, yeah. Okay, no, I'm just going to pretend that nothing that just happened happened. And I'm going to go, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to pick up where we were yesterday, Monday. No, 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 Professor, I'm glad you can do that, but I don't think the rest of us can move on fast enough. <laughs> What's really funny about that to me, and again, I know there's people in the room, there's gotta be some people in the room that are like, okay, okay, but no, really, we need you to move on now. But the truth is what's so funny to me about what Ajan just said, and it, is that in truth, and I bet he even knows this, when I say we're gonna move on right now, the reason that he can stick that in and keep me from that even further is, I'm the last one that actually can move on. Dudes, I can't even move on when there isn't something to move on from. Like, Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so. Where's Kevin? Let me Now you're killing me. All right. God, this, this is a good. You know, do you realize it'd be even easier to take advantage of me if we were actually in person? But okay, we'll talk me about that. Me and Kevin talk about that all the time. <laughs> me and Kevin talk about that all the time. Because you know we're the main two that really just derail you. <laughs> 
But you, you, but you okay, that's very, to everybody. And I really, I hope that this is, I hope that this banter and stuff does not only benefit like Aishan or me or Heaven or whoever's directly involved in it. Like, I hope this is having some sort of effect, positive effect on everybody. Of course, everything Aishan's saying is right. And yes, if we were in person now, oh yes, you could get me off the topic even more easily. But secretly to everybody, you know, part of the reason for that, part, part is that I'm just a sucker, of course, and I'm like a mental mess. But part of it also is like, like, I, I think if I've had any success in physics or in teaching physics, it's in part because of some weird part of me that doesn't actually think any individual item in physics is that important. It's a weird thing that I found out about myself as a teacher like way late. Like other teachers tend to be good teachers because they think everything they do is important. I kind of think that nothing I do is important, but that somehow the whole thing is, like I think that, basically I think that if we talk about like God bless you and sneezing in a smart enough way, that that makes us smarter faster than talking about velocity in a dumb way. Like I kind of secretly think that the point of any physics class is just to make everybody, including me, smarter. And, and that physics is just a really good, usually high probability avenue for doing that. But I'll take any avenue at any time, really. I mean, that's why it does work. Like I just want us all to get smarter. And I, and, and, you know, I'm just trying to create friends here. You all know that, right? This is just a laboratory for me to put in you guys enough stuff so that when you come out of the class, I find it enjoyable to talk with you or you or or to listen to you more than I find most normal adults who haven't gone through classes. Like I can't stand like a lot of adults talking, to them, but I like talking to you guys because I think you're smart. So then I just try to make you a little bit smarter. So then I like talking to you more on the other side. And that's what this is all about. So anyway, so blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so now I'm going to I will, all right, I'm gonna go back to this page in one second, but I'm just, okay, to, to be serious for a moment, what I'm saying is as of the end of the very last class, oh, sorry, I'm looking at, uh, I'm gonna look in the chat in a second, but, and I'm talking right now just about class. I'm not talking about homework or anything. I mean, I have thoughts on that, but like, like right now in terms of class, the very last thing I think we did was we convinced ourselves that if we have an equa a differential equation, of the form dx dt equals some constant times x. Like if we have an equation of that form, first of all, we're saying that is literally called a differential equation. If the x on the right side had been a t, then it wouldn't be called a differential equation. Like that's point number one. Um, and 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 there's a re and and there's a reason for that. Maybe I'll say again in a second. But point number one is if we have an equation of that form, it's called a differential equation, and that particular version of a differential equation, we sort of work through a solution to. We know how to solve it. We solved it by separating a method called separation of variables, where we literally separated the dt's from the dx's, and then we collected all the dx and x together, and we solved like that. And we got a solution to that. Now, that was pure math. Like, that was pure math, like good or bad. That was pure math. Like, there was no actual physics problem that, was, that it corresponded to. But just to be clear, um, Oh, sorry. Clear.
Oh. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, this last bit that I'm cramming at the bottom of the sheet, I'm just gonna put on the next sheet, I'm, my, my bad. I'm so I'm not changing anything, I'm just spreading this out. So. Again, if you just wrote that down, you don't have to erase it, I'm just moving on to the next place. But what I'm saying so far, again, I'm trying to, I'm just, as usual, I'm just trying to a little bit quickly review where we are so, and where we're going. So where we were yesterday was we took our first kind of differential equation we found a solution to it, or what we thought was a solution, by doing some method called separation. But then the key thing I'm trying to emphasize now before we go back to the physics that we need to use this for, um, just note that even we used a method called separation of variables. That's fine. And I, I hope you see how it worked. I'm not asking you to memorize that method. I'm not saying we're even going to use that method a lot. We will use it sometimes. But the key isn't even the method. The key is not the method that we used to get a possible answer. The key to what I'm trying to say right now is why we even believed our answer, especially if some of us might not have been totally comfortable with that method or even what, like even if we could remember it, we're not even sure we believe it or something. The, oh, excuse me. The, the, the key is that that method gave us a possible solution that we thought was possibly or maybe even probably right. But we believe the solution that we got to our first differential equation. We believe the solution because we can check it or verify it by differentiating. Like the whole key here is that we're in solving differential equations, we are trying to do derivatives backwards. Doing derivatives backwards is always harder than doing derivatives forward, like for everybody. Because in the first level of calculus, like even if you don't like it, or even if you're like rusty with some things, what the message that comes across in the first level of calculus, I think this is a correct message. It's like, there are rules for differentiating. And there are, like once you're given a function, if it's not a trick, if it's a normal well-behaved function, it could be very complicated. But if it's actually a proper continuous function, then if someone asks you to take the derivative of it, like with respect to the independent variable, as long as you know your rules, you can follow your rules and get the derivative. It might be long, you might have to do lots of chain rules or something like that, but like differentiating is something we can always do, even if we have to look up some things in a book to do it. But as I think you all know, and I want to reinforce, the, the integrating is harder for everybody. Like people can get differentiating, but then when you're learning integra integration, always gets more fuzzy for everybody for very good and real reason which is that you can write down a normal, continuous, well-behaved function. And first of all, there is no clear rule how you have to integrate it. Like even if integrating it is possible, it's more like, sub, uh, more like puzzle solving and, uh, and tinkering. Like the more experienced people have more techniques for integration and more of a high chance of playing around and getting their answer right. But you have to play around to get an answer right with integration, all of it, like not just students, like people. And as you may well know from calculus class, worse than that, if I write down a well-behaved continuous like function that I might even have gotten from nature, like it might be supported by data, it, 
it may or may not be integrable. Like there are functions that don't have answers when you say, could you integrate this? So, it, so an integrating is the most direct form of doing a derivative backwards. We're here now doing a more exotic form. Like we're now acknowledging that we're gonna have to unpack some derivatives and like do them backwards. And it's gonna entail more than just a, <laughs> a quick integral. Like we are not even sure what the integral might be. So what I wanna emphasize right now is we're do, when you solve differential equations, you are doing derivatives backwards, like you're trying to unpack derivatives, and that by its nature is more of an art than a science. D there isn't a guaranteed answer anytime you go in to do that, unless it's a contrived math exercise or, for that purpose. Um, so this is like this is why we have to like spend all this time talking about it and stuff. But so then whatever method you use to solve a differential equation or to solve an integral is literally that. It's a method. It's a technique. It's a thing that you hope works. It's a tool that you have in your bag that you pull out, but may or may not work. And then you pull out another tool. The only reason any one of us has any confidence going into any differential equation or any integral and, and like the reason we're willing to play is that even if we make a mistake or we don't play well, or we don't have an idea, or even if we're just guessing wildly, the thing we know is we can always verify at the end of the day, as long as we have something to work with, we'll know whether it's right or wrong. It doesn't guarantee getting the right answer, but it guarantees not having an answer that you think is right and then turning out to be not right. Like you can prevent that. So, so, and this is the key. This is what we're gonna carry over to the physics. So just to uh, like uh, try to be, make it concrete, just remember that what we did, like we, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. sorry, sorry, whoa, chaos, what we did, what we did, what we did, it was total chaos, sorry. Sorry, well, we did that, but what we did. And you'll notice I'm like keeping out the numbers now. I'm leaving out the five and the seven because I'm just trying to make our more general point here. So in fact, even for instead of five or seven or K or M, I'm just making a squiggle to represent some constant because I'm trying to emphasize like that's how you should think of constants as just like squiggles. We believe that this was our solution to, to that differential equation. And yes, we got it from separating variables, but that's not why I believe it. That's just how I got my idea to work with. The reason I believe it is then I went or we went or we could have gone, we could say, let's check. And this is the really, this is the part that the first 85 exercise in math methods in the homework are really about is seeing how this verification, the importance of this verification step. Like we checked by doing this, we say, okay, well, what is, let's just, we look, we think that's our answer. So then we just look at it fresh. We just look at it fresh to say, okay, let's just differentiate. If we differentiate both sides, we do chain rules. So we'll get like, blah, 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 like this. I mean, I think we did say this. And that still looks like a bunch of gobbledygook. Like what's that? But then we remember, oh, oh sorry. We, we remember, Oh, nope, did it wrong again. We remember, oh, this is what I need to do. We remember, oh, Like, oh, let me just look in the chat for a second. Ha! <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the chat. All right, fair enough. That's, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, I try not, I just try not to talk to Walters, period, but that's my, no, no, no. Um, I love Walters. I hope that's obvious. Um, uh, 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 uh. 
Okay, wait, no, I'm just going to, I'm going to fall for it, especially to prove that it doesn't have to be a genre heaven. It could be Aaron. The thing that Aaron just put in the chat and I'm totally falling. I, yes, I, I, this, it's going to work. I'm totally falling for, I'm going to take this bait for one minute. Do you, so you guys do know Walters. Yeah, obviously. Do you know that at, wait, should I tell you this? Do you guys have Walters now? Who do you have for lab right now, you guys? You have Woo, right? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. All right. And do you know, okay, again, this is I. This is totally unfair, but again, if nothing else, I want as many people to think they can do this, not just to, do, do, do you know both of the Walters you got? You know, you know Walters, do you know Professor H. Walters as well? Or know of? I mean, you know Professor J. Walters, do you, yes, okay. So can I just point out, I should not say this because I'm good, but I think since you're past having them anyway, maybe I've already told you this. So I was at their wedding. I mean, they're married to each other and I was at their wedding. And at their wedding, um, um, when I was asked to make a toast or a comment, whatever, like say how much I love them, which I do. I literally, I don't know how that I pulled this up, but I literally had with me and pulled out and read at their wedding, which had like over a hundred people or something like wedding typical. I actually pulled out and read their very first physics lab report that they wrote together in Physics 203. I read excerpts of it in front of their whole family. Um, wait, wait, oh, what? oh, no, no, sorry. No, 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 no. Wait, not Wu and Walters. No, no, sorry. There's two different, there's not Wu and Walters. There's two professors named Walters. There's a male Walters. Joe, there's Joe Walters and there's Hema Walters. And you, I think so, you may not, so you, Yabo, you might not have had both of them, but there's, yeah, it's not Wu and Walters. It's two Walters that are both now named Walters. And I'm not even supposed to say that they're married, but you don't, ooh, but you don't have them anymore. Um, but yeah, but they were, but they met in chemistry class at John Jay, one class before I had them. And then after chemistry class, they took together, th this is true. And I, I say this with admiration, this blows my mind. This is literally true. When they were John Jay students, both the Walterses, they took, and they were both forensic science majors, they took every single class in the entire major, they took every single class together except for physics too, because they couldn't make it work in their schedule. Every single class. Now, first of all, I'm saying like, I can't even make my, I could barely get through this institution, you know, make my schedule work for myself, let alone coordinate it with somebody else. They took every class together, and they worked together in every class and they were a great team. I mean, they really were, but yeah, I mean, that's romance, right? Um, and they're still together. I mean, that's really the point, but um, um, okay. Um, yeah. And that just shows you what can come out of John Jay, but uh, uh, um. And of course, I like to tell everybody that they met in physics class, but they didn't. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and by the way, also, okay. What I'm saying here, um, this is a very strange day, I know, but what I'm saying here is that technically we believe our answer. Well, no, the important thing is we actually don't care how we got our answer. We happen to have gotten it from separation of variables, but I'm kind of saying a lot of this because I have to warn you that when we do the actual physics thing next, we're not gonna use that method. I don't want you to get too tied down in that method. What I want you to see is that any method is okay, even if it's fuzzy, even if it's weird, any method that gets you anything to sort of work with and try is okay because then you try it and you literally differentiate it and you literally remember the key step that people often forget, which is after you differentiate it and you get this blue thing like we did here that looks like a bunch of nonsense, you remember to substitute back in, like you see in your expression, your original conjecture for X and you substitute that in and then you can see, aha, like remember, yeah, remember this was the original differential equation was dx dt equals some constant times x. Like again, the constant happened to have been five in our case, but I want to emphasize like we we shouldn't, that doesn't, you know, it could have been five, it could have been three, or it could have just been called b, or it could have been called some constant. Whatever it is, that was our original differential equation. We were looking for an x to satisfy that. And we did some things to find some expression for x. The key thing is, once you have what you think is your X, if you differentiate it, do you get back to the original puzzle, the original expression, the original differential equation? And we did, therefore we believe our answer. Like that's the thing I'm trying to emphasize right now. Okay. And um, right, there's two, right, right, okay. Um, and now, um, 
And now we're going to try to apply this type of thought or this reasoning to the differential equation that actually faces us in the class. Okay, and the differential equation, and the, the reason we're spending all this time, besides the fact that A, we need to understand differential equations, but well, we, so to get back to class now, then we now have, oops, oops, sorry. Should I do that? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're gonna say now is, okay, so so we in effect, we primed ourselves, we, we set up our little system so we could understand what it would be like to solve a first order differential equation. Like that was the example that we were just doing there. Now we're bringing it back to the physics and saying, okay, what physics is asking us to solve is a level harder. Where, Physics is saying, in, instead of dx dt equals some constant times x, physics is saying, saying, okay, physics is saying, now, Now, the physics is saying that there's a K, which means spring stiffness in this parenthesis, and there's an M, which means mass on the spring. But that's coming from the physics. It, it, when the way those K and the, the way that K and the M well, land in um, the expression, they're both constants. And they're both, because they're coming from physics, they're actually both physical constants, right? I mean, they're both real world spring stiffness and real world um, mass. So they are positive numbers, K and M. So, so the whole parentheses just means one big constant, but then, then we put a negative sign before emphasizing that at the end of the day, the constant that we're gonna have here is definitely gonna be a negative one, but that's okay. Like remember in, in the other example we did, we said some constant, it could have been positive or negative. In other words, the right, in other words, we're used to this right-hand side. And I'm saying, by the way, don't get me wrong, the negative sign is super important. I am not at all saying we can ignore the negative sign. It's a fundamentally different thing if there's no negative sign. The negative sign means restoring force, right? And without the restoring force, there's no oscillator. Like this thing is an oscillator because it's being restored perpetually. So I'm not saying that the negative sign is unimportant, but I am saying it's not hard to do. It, it's not going to change what we do because it's like the number neg negative means we're just going to take our constant and multiply it by negative one. It's still a constant. But the left-hand side is now a second derivative, not a first derivative, okay? So, so, the, so we have to solve this. We're again looking for, just like before, we are looking for x as a function of t. That's what we're looking for. And what we did before was we multiplied both sides by dt. We can't do that here because this is a second derivative. And you might even think, can we multiply both sides by dt squared or something? We can't do that actually now because we can't. And the real reason is,
like every now and then I get a really good question. Like every now and then, every semester, one or two students will ask me something that I think other students might be thinking too. <laughs> People do notice like, why are second derivatives written in this wacko way? Like why is the two like in between the D and the X on the top, but then it's like after the D and the T on the bottom. Like that's another one of those little things that just tends to, if you don't ask, or a lot of people don't ask that because it just tends to, it, this seeming inconsistency just reinforces the idea that the way math people write things down is just some arbitrary weirdness on their part. So let's just memorize and assume there's no way of understanding and just keep going. But in fact, that's really unfortunate because there actually is always a, a lot of logic behind the notation and the notation does tell you something. And the reason that derivative second derivatives are written in this funny way is actually for a reason. It's not actually just an accident or something to ignore. What it really means when we write the second derivative of something, what we're really saying is this. I think maybe one of you asked me this last time, but. What we're really saying, I mean, this is why the bottom thing, the whole DT is squared Whereas in the top only the D, it's still, well, it's just trying to indicate that when you take the second derivative of X with respect to T, what you're doing is you're taking, oh, sorry, or oh, even, oh, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Sorry, uh, wait, is John or some, or was there, I don't know. Oh, did I just mute myself or, or mute? Someone? Wait, can you guys hear me or did something just happen or am I just weird? Yes, you're Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, sorry, thank you. So I just wanna emphasize that on the one hand, a derivative is a ratio of differentials. Like it is a rise divided by a run. On the other hand, it's not, on the other hand, so it is involving division, but a derivative can look like multiplication and it's not. A derivative is an operation. Right? The second derivative is not the first derivative times the first derivative again. It's take the first derivative and then take the derivative of that. It's really what, what the second derivative is, is the derivative, it's this, it's the derivative of, sorry, it's the derivative with respect to time of x. Sorry, but yes, it is. But it's the derivative with respect to time of the derivative with respect to time of x. Each derivative that we take is an operation that we're performing on the function. It's not a multiplication that we're doing. So, so that's why d2x dt squared is written in this funny way. It's almost, it's to emphasize that we're not multiply, the squares don't mean multiplication. They mean do the operation again. So actually it's very hard to unpack this thing. You can't actually do, so the, uh, what I'm saying there for, Um, so d2x dt squared, which is now what we have on our left side, it's not separable the way dx dt is. So the bad news of this class is after all the work we, it's not an accident, but after all the work we just did to like separate dx from dt and see how that works and get it to the other side and do this stuff, that particular method is not gonna work here for us. I did, I, again, I didn't teach it like to be a jerk or something. It's a very important method but it's not a method that's gonna work here. What do we do? Well, the, the, the answer is we could do anything that works. Like that method was invented for that purpose. We'll invent a different method for this purpose. But the key common factor between the two is that we'll know we're okay. We can make up anything that might seem to work for us, but at the end, we'll know we're okay or not because we'll check and verify, which is really what the homework two is all about practicing. So I'm gonna go a little farther with this to show. So, so what method will we use here? I'm sorry. The answer, okay, so 
we have to solve this thing. We're back at physics now. We did this like side road of slightly easier math in order to see how to solve it. Now we're back at the physics. And the sad thing is I'm saying, oh, well, the physics, and now I'm saying, oh, but now we're on a second order differential equation. So our old method won't work. Oh, darn. And it seems almost unfair and almost like a waste of time. But then I say to myself, well, wait a second, why do I even have to deal with second orders here anyway? I mean, again, this is not a math class. Like, like, and we bear, like, like, why are we already up to second order differential equations for heaven's sakes? I say to, or for a Sean's sake, I say to myself, um, why? And the answer is because the physics prompted it, right? It's not because I want to do math or hard math or skip around and do math out of order. It's because the physics is demanding this math. So then I say to myself, oh, oh, self, I say self, oh, if physics is the thing that's prompting this differential equation in the first place, shouldn't, maybe couldn't I use physics in order to unpack this or more to the point what I'm really saying is, wait, let's think like a scientist rather than just a mathematician. Let me imagine doing an experiment. Let me think about what the data would do. Uh, let me either literally do it as you are in a way literally doing in lab one and lab two and or, or you're sort of like simulating on a computer and or as long as we're willing to do like lab simulations in a virus, maybe even just even picturing what would happen in the lab might even be sufficient, which weirdly it is. Even if the, if the lab is simple enough, I bet I, if I even picture what I think would kind of happen without a lot of numbers, maybe I get some insight into this, i.e. what I'm saying is. Well, I'm saying now, like, okay, we're in physics now. The physics is saying, the physics is saying that when a mass goes back and forth on a spring, it can be described by this complicated differential equation. And I want to solve the differential equation. I want to get an expression for X as a function of T. So the best thing for me to do as a physicist is imagine what would happen if I took that data. Like if I literally imagine Like, like, let's imagine, or I, I'm saying imagine, because here we are together in the lecture part of the class and we're sitting on computers, but also, you know, in principle, in a way, this is why you did lab one or lab two. If we imagine the actual situation that we're trying to figure out here, if we imagine taking time measurements and displacement or position measurements, so we literally imagine having our mass, we pull it back to like 15 centimeters from the equilibrium position, and we and, and we let it go, and and every and like we let it go back and forth and take a movie of it going back and forth, and then we um, put that movie into Logger Pro or something in our computers and like like you know slow the movie down and everything, and every one tenth of a second we at, we literally take a measurement of where the mass is along you know some meter stick that it's going back and forth and back and forth, and so we plot a table of values of time mapped to positions. Um, it, we, we can either literally do that in reality or we can imagine doing it in our mind. And either way, 
I guess to cut to the chase, what I think we would find is if we if we took that data, and this is why we're physicists, and then if we made a scatter plot, like to get it really, really precise and to get the exact numbers, we actually want to actually do this. That keeps happening. But to get the basic, to get the basic shape of the scatter plot, I think I can even imagine it pretty confidently without even doing it. Like I'm just gonna claim right now based on your lab experience and also because I'm a little short on time, I'm just going to claim right now that if I took careful measurements of a thing going back and forth in space, so remember, I'm measuring its position in one dimensional space, like it could be horizontal space, but there's one dimension of space, and I'm measuring that with regard to one dimension of time. I think, I think you would agree that I should, I mean, the better my lab data is, the better it would look like something like this, I think. Right, like now, you may or may not, rec you probably do recognize that curve from math, but I'm not even giving that curve a name at the moment. I'm not even saying that I would get that from a math class. I'm really saying that I think the mass would go back and forth, back and forth in the, and, in the, and if, if this was a controlled experiment, it would go back and forth in as simple a way as possible. And the simplest, smoothest, okay. Like the basic model that I would expect to find, it wouldn't be perfect, but if this thing is going back and forth and back and forth, in reality, the first thing I would imagine is some kind of back and forth shape, some repetitive back and forth shape on my graph. And, and I would draw the simplest one I can. I mean, I'm not, I mean, there could be imperfections, but I think that would be pattern. Notice, I could have imagined, I could, I could imagine something one step simpler. Like I could imagine, back and forth in a straight lines. Like that would be even simpler than the curve that I just drew, but that's too simple, right? That I would never expect to find in nature. Like the more perfect my measurements were, the less I would think they would resemble that. That jagged sawtooth thing would not, I would not expect to, to, to find in nature because, because I would not expect to find these points in nature. I would not expect to find points where an object instantaneously changes its velocity from some constant forward velocity to some negative velocity. In other words, those jack those corners are points where something was going forward and then suddenly is going backwards with no gradual decline in its speed or gradual increase in its speed. It just literally, according to that graph, something went from 30 miles an hour to negative 30 miles an hour without, without ever passing through zero. That I don't think is possible in nature. So the smoothest, most continuous, most reasonable version of a simple back and forth behavior that I can conceive of would look like this. But, and I'm almost done by the way. Also, I mean, I could even have said, notice I could have said something like this, but I wouldn't even, but that wouldn't be my first guess because I think this object did not start, like when time was zero, this object didn't start at zero. If it had been at the equilibrium position at time equals zero, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. We would have nothing. So <laughs> in our situation, I think the object did start at a non-zero place that we called X naught. So I think this shape is, I'm conjecturing, now again, I don't have to prove that this is right. I just have to argue that this is a reasonable place to consider. Right, if I consider, and by the way, I'm about to wrap this up to, I, I, uh, well, yeah. Um, I'm arguing that if I spend enough time in the lab with a mass in the spring, it is reasonable for me to come to realize or guess or conjecture that the pattern of motion looks something like this. And, and then I know you guys know where I'm going with this. Then that picture of that graph is what suggests to me that I'm gonna guess a cosine, right? Like, like I could have guessed sine if it started zero, zero, but I'm guessing the other. So I think that's a cosine graph, just like many of you, of course, know that looks like a cosine graph to me. Now, again, do I know? Does that prove that my answer is cosine? Not yet. Do I know that the object perfectly, like its motion perfectly embodied the cosine of behavior? No, I don't. But I do think, and, and by the way, do I also, do I, 
know for a fact that there aren't, there, there may be functions in the world that I haven't learned in my math class yet that maybe sort of look like that, but look like more, like maybe there's a function in the world that looks like this or something. Like there certainly could be more complicated things that might even be more realistic. But in science, we never start with the more complicated. We always want our model to be as simple as possible. And then if it doesn't adequately describe, we make it a step more complicated. But this is where I'm going to start my thinking is thinking, oh, I wonder if cosine could describe the situation, okay? And, and I will find out for sure at the end by checking. But right now what I'm working with is I'm conjecturing. Okay, I'm going to conjecture that our answer that we're looking for x as a function of t is, is in fact some kind of cosine shape, like like last time we, uh, oh yeah, yeah. So I'm conjecturing. Now that doesn't mean that I'm saying my answer is x equals cosine t. I'm saying I'm guessing that there's a cosine playing a very important role in my answer. But there may be some before I even check this. Like I may want to be about to check this. I will check it. But before I check it, I have to pause for a second and say, but I am being a physicist here. Could I really believe, like, like that's why I wrote X is a function of the cosine of T. Like I think the cosine piece, I'm now want to try. But I think there may be some other pieces I have to think about first. Why? Because as a physicist, I know I can't take the cosine of a second. Like I take units seriously as a physicist, right? This is not pure math. This is, we're in the lab. I mean, in our minds. So I'm not done, even this conjecture is not yet even ready to be tested as correct or not, because the units of time are seconds and you can't take the cosine of something with seconds. You can only take the cosine of something like measured in radians or degrees if you wanna be that way about it. Um, so there's something missing here. We need, Okay, um, I'm gonna say, so I'm saying, we're guessing that X, remember we're looking for X as a function of T. I'm guessing it's gonna be some function of cosine of T, like that the function will involve a cosine, but I'm guessing it can't be cosine of T. It's gonna to have to be cosine of something times T, something literally measured in radians per second. So the seconds can cancel out with the seconds of T and I can be left with radians and then I could take the cosine of it. Like that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there has to be a, co a constant there that has units of radians per second in order for even give this a prayer of working. I'm going to join my fellow physicist. I'm going to join Monday morning quarterback in like 2020 hindsight. And I'm going to call that constant the same thing that turned out that everybody else calls it, which is omega. But that please understand that doesn't mean anything yet. It's just a name for a placeholder. I mean, it is a placeholder, omega. But I'm good. But I'm and there's obviously there's historical reasons why we chose Omega, I'll get into that. But the point is right now, I could call it anything. I could call it Fred, I could call it some constant, I could call it B, but I'm calling it Omega. So right now I'm guessing, we're just about to. Okay, again, omega is just some constant. I don't, like, 
but it has units of ratings per second. It looks like we're almost there. Like it's something that we could at least verify, but wait, one last thing, as long as we're talking about units, we're still not quite there because X is supposed to be a position or a displacement measured in meters. Like this whole expression is supposed to give us, in the end of the day, it's supposed to give us a place after we've plugged in a time, right? And it's supposed to be a place measured in meters. Well, you take the cosine of anything, you don't get meters, you get like no units, like the cosine of 60 degrees, or excuse me, the cosine of pi over three radians is one half. It's not one half meter or one half degrees or anything. It's just one half. So we're going to need something here, something here. Welcome to my bar mitzvah. Here, we're going to need um, something to multiply all the rest to ensure that meters are in our answer. In other words, we're gonna to have to put some term there whose units are meters. Now I could make up a new name for that, just like I did with omega, except actually this one I already know something about. Whatever we're gonna put there, oh, sorry. Whatever we put there must have units of meters. But also think about this. Whatever we put there is the number of meters that X is supposed to be or would be when T equals zero, right? Because, because remember, I'm saying, I'm, just, I'm saying this. I mean, I should make this a discussion, but again, I'm trying to do this fast. I'm saying, please remember that the sine of zero is zero and the cosine of zero is one. We'll return to fun games with that next class, but the cosine of zero is one, right? So if I plug in zero for T, then this whole thing will turn into one. And, and one is not where the mass was at T equals zero. Where the mass was at T equals zero was 0.15 meters in the case of this problem, or what we in general call X naught. Right, when t equals zero, x is supposed to be equal, by definition, x of zero is what we mean by x naught. So that is what better go here. Still, I'm still guessing, I'm building a guess here, but I'm building it from reasoning, right? I'm saying that, oh, there better be a constant measured in meters right here before the whole thing. And that constant measured in meters, in other words, it better be some kind of position. Oh, it better be the initial position because the, because the initial position means by definition, wherever the darn thing was. At, see, this is how this is going back to why we used the initial conditions to solve for the constants like yesterday and the day before. Like it's all the same logic. It's just, we're just, you get it, everything, or you know, but, but anyway, I'm saying X naught is literally exactly that. It's the constant that is measured in meters and tells us the number of meters that X is when T equals zero, i.e. when the cosine is one. So I say that our guess, so I just came up with, I've just engineered a guess from experimental considerations and units considerations. Like I really used science this time, not math, in order to make a guess for this differential equation that science has forced me to look at. And again, really historically, this is how it went. Like there they were, there was Hook staring at that differential equation. They had to figure out what to do. Um, and so we are, so what we did, well, what we have now is our conjecture. Um, now that's our conjecture. We have two things to do, just like before.
Okay, actually gone longer than I meant to with this. This, but we're actually going to end here in one second. I mean, we're going to end a couple minutes early, actually, um, because anyway, this is this this is a good place uh, to be. I so just what I want to tell everybody is we've now conjectured our a solution to that differential equation. Our conjecture is x equals x naught cosine omega t. We now that's a conjecture. We have to see if it's correct and we have to solve for omega if it is correct. If it is correct, that means that it satisfies, that it's consistent with the differential equation, excuse me, that we started with, the one right under it. If it's correct, it means it's consistent with that. It means that if we take two derivatives of it, we will get something that looks like that. But also I'm saying if it's correct or if it's usable at all, like if it's usable at all, if it's correct at all, it means that there's some way to understand what omega is in terms of the original given constants k and m. If we've done our job correctly, by taking two derivatives, we should be able to show ourselves that yes, when you differentiate this cosine expression twice, you'll get back to yourself with a negative sign. That is what we're kind of saying here, right? Like the differential equation says we've got some x such that when you differentiate it twice, you get back itself but times a constant and times a negative. So we're choosing cosine here kind of because we think that cosine does that, because like it does, because like the derivative of cosine is negative sine and the derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. Oh, when we differentiate cosine twice, we get back a negative times cosine. That's looking good. That's suggesting that we did a right thing by guessing cosine. But now to really know that it really works, we have to find out what, we have to check that and find out what, what omega is written in terms of the original K and M. All of that is totally doable in like two lines or three lines if you literally just take two derivatives of our conjecture. I'm here to tell you, since we have five minutes left, I'm here to tell you that, that A, if you do that, you will find that we are correct. Like I'm not, this is not a wild goose chase. Like that is the correct answer, but I want everybody to see that it is. And you will see what, if you didn't already, what omega is in terms of K over M. I'll even just say it quickly right now. If you do this correctly, you'll find that omega is the square root of K divided by M. Okay. I would ask everybody to do that like right now, but I won't. I will say that what you should do is just try that. Like if you're following me, take a breath, like either now or later or whatever, just try that. See if you see what I'm saying. But then you'll see that all the math methods, like the whole first section of the math math methods homework is kind of asking you to do this over and over just to see this. Um, but this, but last thing, sorry, if we are right and we are right, but you'll check and you'll see that we're right. Like that the answer that what we're looking for here is this to finally close down homework nine. I mean, homework one, once you verify that this is correct, then of course, what this means is plug in one second for T plug in the appropriate K and M into whatever your expression of omega, like plug in all the values, plug in 0.15 for X naught, and you'll get your answer for question nine on homework one. And your answer I think is like 0.116 meters or something like that. But I actually, I know it's 127. I know you're not late, but I'm actually, oh wait, let me just look at this question and think, but I'm actually gonna dash very quickly right after this, if you don't mind, sorry, cause I'm actually late for a meeting. Our co-science on you. Oh, this is a great question. Sorry, wait, the sun's in my eyes, but I know this is a great question. Oh yeah, yeah, no, 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 that, that really is a great question. Um, 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 it's such a great question. I have to be, it's almost more fun than talking about like, like sneezing. Okay, this question of Yabo's, I'm, I deliberately, I'm gonna give a very fast version of it right now, but I wanna talk about it more next time. Um, it's very good for him to notice that cosine and sine very obviously fit this pattern, yes. And, and E, right, and E throws off, the, E doesn't work with the negative signs the way these do, that's right. That's a really good observation. There's something going on here where sines and cosines and E's are the types of answers that we always want for differential equations, but they seem to have a slightly different character with the negative signs. Um, the true answer to Yabo, so it is true that for our other example, we had to use an E. For this example, we find that it's a cosine, um, not an E. For this example, it, it's true for our, what we want in the physics here, our answer is gonna have a cosine, not an E. Are there any other possible answers in the world? It's such a, I do want to talk about it, but it's such a good question. Let me, the fairest thing to say is, oh yes, there are, yes. And the fast version is, in fact, it turns out, and you will see this in the math methods homework or on Monday, you will see that actually, even though cosines go like blah, 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 like are oscillatory, go back and forth, and E functions like go on forever up or they go on forever down, like they seem so different 
But the fact that they have this one thing in common of them both being repeatedly differentiable shows that they do have something deep in common. And the truth of the matter is, I just can't resist this question, I'm sorry. The truth of the matter is that anything you could ever express as a cosine can be expressed with an E and or anything that you want to express with an E can be expressed with a cosine, but this is gonna seem really weird. I'm just gonna say this, I'm sorry. But as we will discuss, and as you'll see in the math methods homework, the way that you can re, the way that you can turn any E into a cosine or turn any cosine into an E is that you have to be willing to throw in imaginary numbers, as weird as that sounds. But once we throw in imaginary numbers, then E and cosine and, and come, E, cosine and imaginary numbers are all together related. And then yes, they allow for other possible solutions besides just this, this is so long, so short story long, this answer that we're getting here, it is the correct answer that we're gonna use in the physics or it is a correct answer that we're gonna use. Like it's not a trick or a waste of time, but Yabo is definitely right that in a very important way, I am not saying it's the only correct answer. In fact, in more ways than one, I am not saying it's the only answer. We're going to see that, but it is a workable answer. It's a solution, not the most general solution. So that's a very good question. I'm going to just leave it. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I, right. I, if you want to, you'll see in the map. Yes, we're going to get to I, believe it or not. We, yeah, but okay. Sorry. I, I actually, um, I'm, very, I'm now late for a meeting. I'm sorry. My bad. But uh, so we're going to just hold it here. If I, and I can't really do more questions. I'm sorry. But if you do have a question, please email or chat or something. But can I just say quick bye and thank you all very much. And We'll be together in the office. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.